Um, okay, everyone. So in this session, we're going to discuss capacity building. Okay, I'm just going to walk you through a couple of principles, um, and then we'll have a, an exercise where you can think through some of this on your own. All right. So in particular, in this session, we have uh, three learning objectives that we're going to get through. Um, please, everyone, if you could come inside and have a seat. Okay, so there'll be three kind of core learning objectives that we'll discuss in this session. So we're going to start with just kind of discussing some of the kind of general principles and ideology behind uh, DHIS2 capacity building. Um, we'll also try to identify the difference between what we call learning and performance solutions. I'll explain what these are. Um, and then we're also going to kind of describe kind of how these areas affect um, budgeting of DHIS2 capacity building activities. Great. So uh, back to Mentimeter, okay. I'll just give everyone a moment to access it. Okay, so the question is, what do you think of when you hear the term capacity building. I'll just wait till I get a couple more responses. Okay, and we have the responses coming in. There's a large agreement here, right? The majority of responses are, are the same. All right, so training, training on specific skills, okay? Okay, so I'm just gonna head back. You can you can enter more responses, okay? Okay, but actually when we think about capacity building, what I wanna do is just dispel the notion that capacity building is just about training, okay? That is a very important component. There's no doubt about that, okay? But as an umbrella term, it also refers to areas of staff development, of recruitment, of retention. Okay, we need to build strong teams. Anna talked about a DHIS2 core team in the previous presentation. That is something we need to build often from the ground up. And we need to think of strategies to keep that team in place. That means sustainable strategies to make sure they're funded, 
to make sure we're recruiting the right personnel, to make sure that we have plans in place to keep them, you know, happy and, and kind of well suited for their tasks, to modify their descriptions, to make sure that we're evaluating them correctly. So there's a whole other kind of portion here, which is a bit more on the kind of human resource development side that is also associated with capacity building. So we can't just look at it in a bubble and saying, okay, we're going to implement a new system now. We focus on the training with the staff we already have. In some situations, this means we're not going to be able to succeed in all areas that we intend to, okay? So sh we shouldn't just separate these two out. We should actually think about these two together because they're one and the same, right? You bring on new staff, you need to train them or you change staff's roles. Similarly, you need to train them to make sure that they fit into those new roles. So often we might also assign people new responsibilities Okay, now you, you, you're already existing, you have previous work responsibilities. Now you're also responsible for implementing DHIs too. Learn everything you can, but we're not going to change your previous work. You still have to do that too. You just have to do this in addition, right? And that can create problems as well, because then the person just doesn't have any time. So we have to kind of think about these in line with one another. So we split these off into kind of two, two kind of ideas. So one is learning solutions, and this is our training, okay, training materials, job aids, maybe coaching, one-on-one -on -one kind of discussion, okay? And then we call the second one kind of performance solutions. This is um, about how we evaluate our staff, maybe modifying their jobs, hiring practices, um, you know, changing terms of reference or writing terms of reference to kind of attract the correct people, making sure they have the right skill, okay? Working through that other process of making sure all of that is in place. So we're going to kind of discuss both of these and their importance in, in affecting kind of a DHIS2 implementation. So just in general, um, capacity building as a, as a concept, it's, it's kind of a foundational principle of scaling DHIS2 implementations. We, we really can't proceed, um, you know, the way we work is not such that you just hire an outside developer, we give you a product, and then you kind of go on your way right? That's not how we work in practice when we're thinking about DHIs too. We sit down with teams, we kind of understand what their needs are, we work with them together and try to build something that kind of works over a very long period of time, right? So scaling the system, it requires different levels of skills in utilizing DHIs too as well. So we also have to think a little bit about how we segment our teams out because not everyone has to learn every skill, right? And that's also reflected even in our instruction team where we have different kind of um, responsibilities, different areas of expertise, right? And that also should happen within kind of the, the teams that you're helping and, and designing. Not everyone has to know everything, right? You kind of share the responsibility. And there's different models of kind of capacity building um, based on the challenges that you're trying to address, right? So. Maybe not everyone has to go to a configuration training all the time, for example. That might just be a smaller subset of people. All right, so we're going to, just because I kind of anticipated that the responses would be mostly focused on training, I'm going to try and spend a little bit of time discussing kind of these areas of, of, of human resource development and capacity building there. All right, so here's a couple, a bit more detail on this, right? So just a couple examples of these different solutions that you can try and think through or work through, right? So we have um, hiring practices, and this can include, you know, making sure you have valid job descriptions for your staff, whether they're new staff, okay, or whether you're recruiting um, or, or whether you're modifying the, the kind of jobs of, of existing staff members, right? You want to make sure that their responsibilities are in line with what they actually have to do. So there is some accountability there, okay? We're going to talk about this core team concept quite a bit, um, um, and just to explain what it is and what the different roles are. But ideally, every implementation should have a dedicated DHIS2 core team, and we're going to explain this in some more detail. We also have various evaluation practices. So we know that there are challenges with keeping staff, especially working for the government, right? There's often issues with salaries, with payment, and there might be more attractive offers especially once you learn specific skill sets, right? Maybe by the private industry or maybe by others, right? But that really takes away then. There's kind of this, uh, um, you know, knowledge drain away from the government ministries. So we need to find interesting ways that we can keep staff engaged in the program 
And it might not always be through salary because that might be something difficult to achieve, right? You might not always be able to give someone more money, but there are other ways that we can think about kind of making sure they're, they're a little bit more happy with their job in their day-to-day -day life. Okay? And then there's also this area of job modification, right? And that's kind of what I mentioned earlier. If you have existing staff that will have new responsibilities, you really need to weigh what it is they will actually do, what they will perform, what they're responsible for. And we can't just you know, keep dumping more and more stuff on existing staff because that creates a lot of difficulties for those staff members and they won't really be happy with what they're doing. So I'm going to hone in on this DHIS2 core team concept a little bit, just to describe uh, what it is, okay? So core teams, they manage the implementation and evaluation of DHIS2, and they're based in the country that is implementing DHIS2, okay? So if a HISP group or if the university is, is supporting an initial implementation, they are not the core team, okay? They're just there as support at the beginning. And we'll kind of discuss that relationship, how the groups support core team development okay but this team should be based in country it doesn't necessarily have to consist of only government or ministry staff you could have some private um, staff as well or maybe from outside institutions like a university for example involved in this okay but the idea is they they live there okay they're there every day and this team should be dedicated to working on dhis2 okay so it might seem like I'm asking a lot, but we're just trying to make sure that things are sustainable as possible because we want the government to be able to take over as much responsibility as possible, or at least this core team, right? So the, the size of the team can vary, right? We don't want to just grab, we know it's not easy to fill all these positions. I'm going to describe the roles in a moment, okay? They can consist of roughly four to six people. Now the size of the implementation might affect this a little bit, you know, if you're a country of, you know, 300 million, like in Indonesia, for example, you might need more than six people, right? Um, but then if you're a smaller country, you might not even have the ability to fill in four positions, right? So it kind of depends a little bit on the context itself. But just generally speaking, we have at least four specific roles, we should have at least four people to fill those roles. Sometimes that's not the case, however, and we do understand that. Okay. So when we look at the actual positions within this team, we have four core roles that we've identified, and we kind of have four extra roles that are kind of providing input into the core team from time to time, right? So they're not always needed to be involved in everyday kind of decisions, but you will need their input quite frequently. So the four core positions that we advocate for that are part of every core team Okay, our, um, I'll just list them now and I'll explain them in a moment. They are the DHIS2 operational lead, a DHIS2 trainer, what we call a DHIS2 implementer. And some of you put this as your kind of job description at the beginning. So you may be a little familiar with this concept already. And then we also have a server administrator. Okay? And I'm just going to kind of explain what these roles are a little bit. Okay. So in Anna's presentation just now, she mentioned a little bit about donor coordination, project planning, okay? And these are very important components that are sometimes missed when we look at DHIS2 implementations, right? There's often maybe a lot of kind of reliance on external parties to support the planning and the coordination of these projects. But this is very important to build internal capacity to manage those projects within this core team. So the DHIS2 operational lead is actually kind of the lead person who, who helps with all this support, okay? So a lot of the concepts that we've been discussing and, and will discuss today on budgeting, on planning and infrastructure, okay? This operational lead, they will understand those concepts. They will have an ability to speak to partners about what's possible. They will be able to kind of filter out good and bad ideas and make suggestions. Okay, and they'll also have a bit of DHIS2 knowledge as well, right? Um, so they're the kind of the team lead of this whole operation. Okay, they manage the team, they make sure everyone's happy. They also speak to external partners and kind of discuss with them how we can bring together projects and align the interests of the kind of ministry in this situation. Okay, they're also responsible for kind of ensuring 
that the system is implemented in an integrated fashion so that you don't get all this fracturing of systems, which can happen even within DHIS2. You can have multiple DHIS2 systems managed by multiple people, and the communication is not there. So the ability even to move data or look at data together becomes very challenging, even just within DHIS2. But this person will also be looking at an overall integrated architecture, which we will discuss a little bit more, because DHIS2, it's, it's very unlikely, and we don't even really recommend that DHIS2 is the only system that you are using. You will have other systems, so you need to think about how this fits into that integrated design overall within the country, all right? So this person kind of has a big picture kind of role, but also does understand a bit of the operational principles and how DHIS2 works. We also have a specific role for a trainer, okay? And this person will also understand DHIS2. So um, you do have, you know, roles in training where maybe you have uh, someone who just creates materials and things like that and doesn't really understand the subject matter. We don't recommend that in this situation. We do recommend that this trainer does also understand how DHIS2 works and can create material based on their own experience with working with uh, the system and with speaking to users in the field. So they lead the development of various training materials of support documentation, job aids, et cetera, okay? They provide both um, uh, training of trainers. So for example, to uh, their own staff, that their own core team staff maybe, or staff at the province or district level who will train other people, okay? We often work on this model and they will also support direct end user training. So maybe when people have challenges with accessing the system or performing basic operations. So it's kind of a wide variety of skills that this person will kind of um, contribute to. And they can focus also on both fundamentals concepts. So maybe for people just getting started as well as advanced concepts because there will be at some point in time, the need for that core team to expand their skills and kind of learn more advanced principles of how to kind of configure and work with DHIS2. We then have this implementer role, and this is our kind of broadest role, I will say. Uh, this person often has a mix of many different responsibilities. They can be a mix of a program expert, uh, as well as maybe someone who understands DHIS2 configuration very well. They could be maybe be more focused on a health area, right, and understand that health area very well and be able to speak to partners and other people within the ministry to understand their public health needs and requests. They could be very DHIS2 focused and kind of really understand how to configure the system, operate the system, explain features within the system. So there's a bit of a mix here in terms of responsibilities um, that this person can have, but they often, just to kind of summarize, they often lead that requirements gathering and configuration process. So it might be the same person speaking with various units within the Ministry of Health, who then is also subsequently configuring those requirements that they've discussed, okay? They're also responsible for developing solutions for integration within that broader system. So at that top level, you kind of have to think about how does DHIS2 fit in with all the different systems that I have, okay? But then this implementer will actually be responsible for actually making this work, right? So we often see like in diagrams or conferences, you see arrows between system, two systems or something like this. The implementer actually is the one who implements those arrows to make sure system one can talk to system two, okay? They also develop, implement, and evaluate what we call standard operating procedures. So these are kind of best practices and guidance for the implementation, all right? The last role we have is a server administrator. And this person probably doesn't need to work full-time uh, as a core team member can work about half, half the time, but you do need a dedicated person. And this also depends a little bit on your hosting needs and your hosting requirements, which we will do uh, later on in the, uh, today's sessions. But this person manages the server, okay? The DHIS2 application and any other related web services. So maybe there's a, an email system or a SMS system, any type of related infrastructural service, this person should kind of have some insight into. Um, and even if you're hosting um, outside, so you're working with an external provider, you should 
still have a person within your team who understands these basic principles. So you can set up backup procedures. You can talk to the hosting um, provider to make sure all your specifications are correct. Okay, you still need someone there, even if you've outsourced your hosting. Okay. So there's a number of different kind of competencies then that I've described that this team much must might have. So just to summarize, right? So they need to kind of understand quite well DHIS2 system design and analysis. So this is really discussing requirements with users, understanding what DHIS2 can do and translating those requirements from kind of discussion over to actual kind of features that people can actually use, right? We also have to have the team responsible or understand DHIS2 customization, um, architecture, okay, um, what we call metadata, which are the variables that we create in the system. And this also includes aspects of interoperability because we want DHIS2 to communicate with other systems. And we need an understanding of how to implement some of these in practice. Um, it can't just be a discussion with boxes and arrows and workflows, right? We actually need to, someone to sit down and make that work. Um, we also need them to kind of understand DHIS2 implementation um, best practices. So we discussed some of these principles over the last couple of days, um, but just uh, some examples include harmonization of forms. Um, I had some questions actually from a couple of people. Um, what if I bring data into the system? It's the same data, but it's collected by two different programs and the values don't match, okay? It's a very common occurrence, okay? It's something that we need to work through and figure out which data value do we use, what is the source of our data, right? And this is someone who kind of needs to sit down and go through everything and speak um, with um, the Ministry of Health uh, about this and how they can kind of improve their practices on these data collection tools. Um, we also need kind of a bit of understanding of, of data use and how to kind of set up good visualizations and indicators for the programs. So one area that you will find probably in practice is if you sit down um, with a, a ministry or a, a unit within the Ministry of Health, and you say, okay, give me your dashboard. Okay, and they'll just kind of look at you and say, okay, I don't even know where to start. Okay, that, that's an often kind of frequent occurrence. So sometimes they need a little bit of suggestions showing them, you know, how DHIS2 can display data, what's possible to give them some incentive and ideas to kind of think through their own planning. Um, planning and conducting training of trainers. Okay, this is also something very important. So this is where we actually train other people to perform training in the field. It's really the only way you can scale. So if you if you think about training thousands of users potentially, a team of four to six people will not be able to train a thousand users. Right? You will need to subsequently um, share those responsibilities with others. And then this project management and administration component is also very very key. Um, to this whole operation. Okay, so some, some kind of core principles and some words of caution that I'm going to recommend. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of use a real example here in a moment. So, so these positions, they're not empty titles, okay? You can't just say, okay, someone, DHIS2 is new, it's exciting, there's funding coming in for it. I want to be part of that team, but I'm just going to sit there and I'm not going to do anything, okay? You cannot appoint people in such a position. These people need to be willing to sit down and really get their hands dirty. They're going to be working on the configuration. They're going to be understanding requirements. They're going to have to meet with a lot of different people and kind of come to a consensus. It's not always easy work, right? But the idea is that these people need to kind of be ready. And I think it is quite rewarding in the end, right? So the persons in these positions, also at the beginning in, in particular, they might not have all the skills that I've been listing out and that I've been describing. And that's okay, right? You're not looking for the perfect person. I think that's kind of the enemy here, right? You're looking for a person with potential who's willing to learn and work with you, okay? And, and kind of gain skills over time. This is a long project with a long horizon, okay? And we want that team to be there for a very long time as well. So we don't want to discourage people at the beginning, you know, saying, oh, sorry, you don't know what you're talking about. We don't want your help anymore. That's not what we want to do, right? We want to encourage people to learn. We want to put them on a path to success. Okay. The team itself, so Anna mentioned, a lot of these teams, there's not enough budget for, right? So the team itself, it, it, you need to advocate for kind of dedicated support for this team 
so they can invest in their own learning, right? That is often an issue where, you know, people kind of say, well, why don't you know how to do this? Well, that's not really the idea. They might not have all these competencies at the beginning, right? And that's what we're trying to highlight. Um, the team itself, as I mentioned, um, we're often involved in this training of trainers approach. And then we have the HISP network. And I'm going to just briefly touch on this. We'll talk about it more later. The HISP network, we're, we're always here. We're always here to support you guys. Okay. But over time, the amount that you depend on us should lessen. We're not looking to stay in the country and just make money off you guys for eternity. That's not our model, right? Our model is to provide a lot of intensive support for, for the beginning portions. Okay. And then slowly we taper off. And then you ask us questions when you need help. Right. But for the most part, you're able to handle the day to day operations on your own. Okay. So I just want to kind of go through um, a little bit of how core teams work with you in this process. Right. So I just listed out a little case here. Um, um, the country is in the process of implementing DHIS2. They want to create or increase the capacity of their core team. So it partners with the HIS network in order to get started. How does the HIS group support development of the core team? All right. So as a start, any new activity that they're working on is conducted together with the core team. So let's say you ask for new data sets, new indicators, new dashboards, and you want that implemented in the system. In an ideal scenario, the HIS network will sit down with members that have been identified and perform this configuration together. They don't just perform it for you and then hand it back. Say, okay, everything's set up. Now you can use the system. That's not what we want to do because that means that the team doesn't really understand how it works, right? So it can add time at the beginning um, when you're implementing a lot of new stuff because people are learning a lot of new skills. So you can kind of add this into your timeline a little bit because you know, you're working back and forth with the HIST groups or the HIST network and, and kind of trying to understand, well, how does this work? How do I make this? How do I implement this? The EPI program asked me for this report. Can I make it, you know? And what do I actually need to do to get there? So there's a lot of back and forth there and, and, and the kind of support should be there for that, right? Gradually over time, the core team should kind of take more and more control of these tasks. So a good example, especially where core teams can start is with end user training. So for example, showing people how to enter data, how to access dashboards, view indicators, things of this nature. Now, maybe at the beginning, the HIST group has to be there and help with the initial training, right? But maybe the core team should try conducting that training with the HIST group there, right? And the HIST group can kind of step in and support where needed. But the whole idea is to get this group to kind of this core team to kind of gradually take on more and more responsibility um, over time. Right. So I'm going to just give a little story, okay, about a lesson learned on core team planning. Okay, so I'm not going, I've worked with a number of countries, I've, I've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to work with a number of different countries, and I'm going to present a real life example here. Okay, so in DHIS2, we have a, a user role called a super user. Okay, and this role means that I can do anything inside of the DHIS2 system. I can access the data, I can create variables, I can modify forms, I can do whatever I want, okay? Now, the country that I was working in, I was brought in a bit later into the implementation, okay? And this super user term became a very politically charged term. Now, typically we would only, if we look at the different core team members that I identified, we would only give this to very experienced core team staff. So maybe like three to four people in the whole country would have that particular role, okay? But in the setting that I was in, we had extremely senior level people with this type of access. We had external consultants, people who were not in the country with this type of access, and it created a lot of chaos. So this was the deputy director of the Ministry of Health, okay, the director of the HMIS unit, we had several UNDP, UNFPA, WHO staff with this level of access, and none of them had been trained on how to use DHIS2. But they wanted to be a super user because that meant that they were kind of at the top of the hierarchy within the DHIS2 configuration. The team itself had a very good core team. There were about four to six staff members that we were working with 
training regularly and they were very skilled, but they were also a bit younger, okay? A bit less experienced than these other staff. And that was an issue, okay? Even though they knew more about the specific subject matter. So about two years, we warned them at the beginning, actually. So when I came in, I kind of saw this and I, and I warned them and I said, you know, we, we can't, we can't have this because there's go it's going to cause us problems down the line. Eventually, your system is going to have many issues if people start doing things that they shouldn't. We should give this authority back to the core team. And, you know, no one really listened to me, and, and that's fine. I was also quite young at the time, okay? But then about three years later, the system just became completely unusable, okay? No one could, end, no one could log in. You couldn't import any data. You couldn't create any single report because all this duplication of information had been created. Data was being entered in the wrong places. If you tried to bring in legacy data, you couldn't match the data with anything, any existing structure in the system. You had users with all kinds of access that had been created by WHO, by UNFPA, by others who should not be creating users, but giving access to all their partners and friends. Okay, people are seeing the data without the authority to see the data. It created a lot of problems. So we had to basically destroy that system and build it from the ground up. I'm just outlining this process here. I'm not gonna go through it all, but it, take, it took us five months to rebuild their system. For five months, they basically couldn't use their system. We had to go through these extreme steps of rebuilding each component and then really ensuring that the core team is empowered. Because in parallel to this kind of detailed configuration, we really worked to advocate for the core team to get their authority back to perform the work that they need to. It was a kind of key critical missing step where it just kind of evolved into the situation that got out of hand. So my point here is that we really need to advocate for the right people to be part of this and really need to kind of build the skills appropriately, right? So we need to be a bit more careful in terms of how this is doled out. It is not a political appointment. It's not an empty appointment. We also shouldn't be sending them to trainings, to conferences, to meetings. That was also another issue, right? We had the deputy director come to an academy of some kind. It was a very technical training. Of course, they did not really learn anything. They were not interested in sitting there and, and dealing with the details, right? So just a bit of a word of caution that this core team really needs to be empowered. They really need to take responsibility. We need to advocate for them to have the right type of role within the system. Otherwise, you don't want to end up in a situation like this, right? And then, you know, you could, you could blame it on DHIS2 or whatever. You know, that happened a lot too. Oh, DHIS2 is a terrible system. Let's not use it anymore. There are many other donor interests. Oh, let's implement our own system. DHIS2 isn't working anymore, right? So you also don't want to get into that situation. You've invested in a platform. You're using it for several years. And then, you know, people just come in and try to build something else in parallel. And that can also create a lot of trouble, right? So this whole idea can... can um, have some impact on, on kind of how you work through things. All right, so let me see what I'm doing here. Okay, so this is this second part here is going to focus on learning solutions. This is the area where I think a lot of you are more well versed in, right? This involves training basically, right? So we have various types. We have uh, in-person training, online training. We might have various manuals or videos, other types of supplementary tools um, that we provide um, to individuals. Um, I've just listed some examples here if you want to review um, some of them. I'm sure you have your own training materials that you've developed. We have a lot of documentation and guidance on actually conducting trainings on various steps you can take um, to support that process of building learning solutions. Uh, this takes a lot from kind of adult learning um, principles, basically. Um, so you can just open those up and, and have a view at some of those resources. So one of the areas that I'm going to talk about is the DHIS2 Academy, and then I'll also focus on end user training and, and talk about how they kind of supplement each other. All right. So you're here at a DHIS2 Academy. So let's just talk a little bit more about this. I know a lot of you are also interested in learning more about the configuration, for example, uh, and some of the other stuff that, that we're not necessarily focusing on in this particular course. So DHIS2 Academy, it's a global or regional training. Um, you know, and it can take place in person or online, right? So it can introduce either kind of latest features, apps, or concepts, or kind of best practices for implementation. Right now, we're focusing more on the implementation component, okay? It's meant to train core team staff, 
okay? And this is where my word of caution comes back into play. We don't just send anybody or try not to have anybody come to these academies. We really want to focus on upscaling the, the core team staff's capabilities, okay? Um, and we don't really send end users to these trainings um, as well because we we're talking about a lot of advanced principles um, in, in these courses, okay? Now, now, one thing that uh, we should make clear is that these are supplemental to in-country trainings. They do not replace them, right? So the idea is to give you a solid foundational ba basis on specific skills. So for example, if you want to learn about how to configure aggregate data sets, okay, you might come to the academy and just learn about this in general. But your configuration is always going to be specific. You might have translations, specific indicators, specific forms, and you need to kind of make sure that you can manage all of that, right? Not just like a generic overall solution. So this is kind of meant to provide a foundational basis. So when you go back uh, to your country, you can have more, much more detailed discussions on the configuration. Okay. Um, so this is kind of the, the training model that we have right now, okay? Uh, we have our fundamentals courses at the bottom, okay? And these are our very, uh, these are our introductory courses, right? If you've never used DHIS2 before, this is where you start, okay? It gives you a good background of how to use DHIS2, of how to configure some basic forms and indicators, data sets in DHIS2, okay? And this is completely online. It's free to, free to use at any time. Okay? We then have our level one academies, okay? And our level one academies, tend to focus a little bit more on DHIS2 use and configuration. I'll go over some of the courses, okay? These are delivered by our HISP groups. So we have uh, HISP uh, um, Southeast Africa, which delivers our English academies in Africa, West Africa, which delivers in French. Um, we have the Portuguese speaking community, we have Asia, right? So by region, we have these academies and the HISP groups are responsible for kind of considering requests in that region and contextualizing that material but the curriculums are standard, right? So it doesn't matter if you're getting trained in Asia or Africa, we use the same curriculum, okay? Yeah, at some point we're gonna have to consider how to how to have uh, academies in, in, in Arabic in uh, the, this region as well. Um, we then have these level two academies, you're at one right now. This is typically delivered by the same group of, of people, core, core team within our team. Um, and these can focus on implementation aspects a bit more perhaps than uh, um, technical topics, but we also have technical topics for this as well. So um, I've just, our courses are changing all the time. So rather than list them all out, I've just listed categories for the courses to give you a better idea of what we do offer, right? So we have courses specifically focused on system use, both for aggregate and for tracker that talk about things like data entry using both a computer or laptop or a web device, as well as data analysis or visualization of the data. Once again, both for case-based and aggregate data, okay? We also have courses that focus on system configuration and we, we split this up into three categories, basically, aggregate, um, a tracker or case-based data and Android configuration. So there's specific kind of configuration principles if you're using a mobile device. We also have some courses on development processes. So this includes um, app development, both web app development, as well as Android app development. So if you want to create an application of some kind, okay, as well as server administration. So this is dealing with the server, managing the instances, upgrades, things of that nature, and integration. Okay, This is a new course that focuses on interoperability specifically. We also have our implementation courses. One was right here, this RHIS course. We also have specific courses on Tracker and Android. And then we have subject specific courses. Um, we have a new domain education we're dealing with, um, data quality. I focused on a couple features yesterday, but our data quality course is five days in length, right? So it's not something I could cover that quickly. Um, and then we have logistics and community health and, and other examples, disease surveillance. These are kind of given on an as needed basis, all right? So we offer a number of different courses, and as I mentioned, these courses are to give a foundational basis to people. They're not meant to replace any type of in-country training. So if you wanted to learn about interoperability, you might attend the Integration Academy, but when you go home, you still have a lot of work to do, okay? It doesn't end just with the Academy itself. Okay, I'm going to save some of this. Okay. Now, supplemented with the Academy training is end-user training. All right. 
So we also want to make sure that we're training uh, kind of end users at regular intervals, right? And there's a combination of approaches you can use. But if you're scaling up your system, you really want to focus on making sure everyone is comfortable with utilizing that system, right? So if they're new users, people who've never seen the system, um, I always recommend that the training is done in person where possible, okay? But after that, especially if they become more a bit more experienced, money becomes an issue, right? It's hard to travel to all these places and train thousands of users. So there might be other approaches such as online training or remote coaching that you can use to supplement in-person efforts. Okay, um, and I, I say end users, but we can take these end users and separate them into many categories. So we can have users that enter data, we can have users that help with configuration and maintenance of the system. We can have specific m and &E focal points who might be more interested in data analysis, right? So there's a number of different distinctions here, and we need to kind of train all these different users to fit their role as best they can. Okay. Now, one kind of specific um, principle to keep in mind here, training needs to be continuous because DHIS2 is not a static system. Right? It'll expand, it'll change, it will be modified. Right? There will be new features, you'll upgrade DHIS2 from one version to the next. Right? So we always need to keep a, a kind of long-term training plan where there's continuous training available, both for our core team, because okay? they need to learn the new stuff in order to train people, okay? as well as our end users, because they need to, you know, the core team needs to train them to use this, or you're not going to be able to implement new programs, new features, new reports, et cetera. Okay. Okay, so I'm actually gonna leave this for now because we're gonna talk about budget later, all right? So, so what I wanna do is actually, I have a bit of an exercise for you to think through um, your core team and, and plan this out a little bit. So if I go back to Moodle here, So in this implementation considerations uh, section, um, there's a capacity building exercise here, okay? So what I'd like you to do, and, and what I would suggest is that you sit in your country teams um, to do this. Um, don't try to do this alone. You will need to maybe talk to other members um, within your country. All right, so I'll open it up. There's two documents. One is a PDF document that describes the exercise. And then there's a supplemental tool here um, an Excel sheet. Okay, and I'll open both of them up. And I'll just describe describe the exercise a bit before we get into it. Okay, so um, this, this uh, exercise focuses on your core team, okay, developing and identifying uh, members within your core team. So we identified four roles as part of this process, right? an operational lead, implementer, trainer, and server administrator, right? And, and what I've done, if uh, I said here, there's full, we have full job descriptions for these roles. So I described them a little bit, but if you scroll down to Annex 1, I kind of have full terms of reference for each of these roles, okay? So you can read through those um, just to give you a bit more background on, on each specific role. Okay. Now, what I'd like you to do is think about your own context and try to identify staff that might be available to fill each of these four roles. Now, as I mentioned, these staff don't need to have every single competency that is listed in those roles, okay? They need to kind of have the potential or be willing to kind of learn new skills to fit into those roles. So they might need to have some basis. Um, you know, you probably shouldn't select um, someone with no um, computer engineering background or um, very little computer knowledge to, to be your technical implementer, right? That might not be appropriate, okay? But what I'd like you to do is think about your own context and just identify who might fill these particular roles, okay? These four roles that we've identified. Okay. Um, now, if you're not able to identify a person to fill that role, okay? Because that might happen. You might not have anyone at the moment who could fill that role, okay? But then what are some next steps you could take in order to kind of build support around filling these roles? Do you need to hire someone new? 
Do you need to look outside? Do you need a bit of extra support? Are you not sure and you need to ask us questions? Okay, just try and think through that process a little bit if you're not able to identify someone to fill these roles. Okay, so the next step is once you have identified those individuals, as I said, they might not have all the skills or competencies, okay, that I'm describing. And that's okay, because even within our team, we don't have all those competencies, okay? It's just very common, right? So there's a second sheet here. It's called Capacity Building Needs Assessment. I'll just open that up. Okay. And what you can do is for each staff member that you've identified, go through this and identify which skills they currently have and which ones they might need some extra support in. So for each role, you'll see here, here's the implementer role. Okay, maybe I'll just I'll zoom, try to zoom in as much as I can. Okay, this is the implementer role. And we have a list of skills that this person should ideally have. Okay, and we have descriptions of those skills as well. And then in the in the third column here, you have the current status, and there's a drop down menu. The drop down is probably pretty small, but you'll be able to see it on your screen. So the categories are not yet achieved, early understanding, adequate understanding, mature understanding, right? So just to kind of gauge their current capability, their current capacity, right? And what you want to do is take each of those staff members that you've identified. And you could do it theoretically. If you don't have anyone identified, you could actually take one you know, even if you just take one staff member, maybe, and work through this exercise, okay, and it's not meant for criticism, please don't use this as a, a, a tool for criticism, right, that's not what it's meant for, it's meant to identify areas they need support in, because we really want to make sure that they have these skills, and, and, you know, this will lead for opportunities for training for them, right, so we have the implementer role, if I scroll down, the operational lead, okay, all of them have different skill sets, uh, the server administrator and the trainer. Okay. So we just want to be able to take, you know, one person might perform more than one role in your team. That's okay. But if they're only performing the, inter uh, let's say you've identified them as the implementer, you would only fill out the implementer section for that staff member. You would have another copy for the next role. Okay. Okay, so the third part of this exercise, you might not get through it all right now, and that's okay, okay? But after you have identified your staff member, okay, and I would just say take one staff member and perform the needs assessment or one role, okay? Don't try to get through all four. It's going to take too much time. So let's say you've identified a trainer, just go through the trainer role, okay? After you've identified those members, you've gone through the needs analysis, you need to make a plan for training for that individual, okay? Because the whole idea, like I said, this is not criticism. This is building a, an effective, sustainable plan, okay? So we have an example of a training plan, a template, okay? And I just put academies in here, okay? But this should be a combination of academies, of local trainings, okay? Of maybe coaching support, right? That this person can regularly have Okay, and, and I put a two year horizon as an example this year and next year, you could do maybe uh, starting next year, for example, instead. Okay, but the idea is that you know you want to be able to make sure you have people identified for these roles, they know what their responsibilities are, you know where kind of there are areas in which they need further support, and you've identified actual ways you're going to build their skills right. Um, I would say don't assume that you just leave it to the person, and then they're not able to do that. Now, the next part of this is actually budgeting for these because this does cost money, of course, but we will talk about that more um, later on. All right. Okay, so to summarize, there are three components to this exercise. Identify your core team members. Okay, try to assess their current skills and knowledge and then develop a training plan for those core team members. And I would say, just try to do this you could identify all four members, perhaps, or all four roles, but just focus on one role for actually assessing their skills and developing a training plan, okay?
Any questions so far? Maybe when you have a look? Or, or any clarification maybe uh, from Hanin and Abdul Rahman in Arabic? Okay. Yes, Jean-Paul. For me, uh, it's just to appreciate um, this um, strategic way of um, identifying and transfer, I mean, creating, identifying and transferring the capacity to this team, because practically this is what we need for uh, efficient implementation of DHIS2. Um, maybe by experience, I wanted just to uh, brainstorm something, I mean, to ask anyone to brainstorm how uh, maybe efficient to create this uh, core team. Because um, we have seen that uh, even though it's good to include different expertise, either they are part of the HMIS or they from outside of the HMIS, but those members of the core team who are from outside of the HMIS, you know, they have other assignments from where they are working. And uh, in most cases, they are not paid from the HMIS. Mm. They are paid from where they are located. So um, it's good also to analyze and see the availability in terms of time. Because mm -hmm. if you assign them a lot like uh, operation manager or system administrator, yet they have other permanent full-time assignments, you're likely to fail because they will not be um, full-time for uh, uh, core team uh, assignments. So um, maybe that's... Uh, Think I want just to highlight it's good when you are formulating this team, it's good to see and even to consider the availability of the core team, especially when they are coming from outside of the HMIS team. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Shah Paul. Okay, so I, I see some people discussing already. So I'm just going to walk around. Okay, if you have any questions, just raise your hand. We'll come and help you. Okay, but we're going to work on this exercise until lunchtime. Okay. Very engaged in the exercise. Um, I really appreciate um, seeing that. So what we're going to do, I know some of you, maybe you haven't had the opportunity to work through the entire exercise, okay? So we're not going to ask you to do anything with it quite yet, okay? Continue working on the exercise together through the remainder of the day. Tomorrow, because we have more exercises today, okay? We have several exercises related to these implementation principles that tie together, okay? So throughout the day, you might not get through all of it, okay? But tomorrow we're going to have a chance to reflect on these exercises, all the different components. We will talk about infrastructure as well later on today. We have some exercises there as well as architecture, okay? And tomorrow we might have either a bit of an open discussion or have some, some people present back what they've done or where they are right now in the process so we can reflect a little bit more and share some experience um, regarding where we're at, okay? So, so thank you very much for engaging. I hope the exercise has been useful. Continue to work through the exercise the remainder of today. And tomorrow, we're going to look at the exercise both from this session as well as the other sessions together, okay? We'll explain the other exercises momentarily after lunch, okay? So lunch is ready. So uh, please, it's in the same area as every other day. Enjoy your lunch. We'll come back in one hour at 1.30. Okay, thank you very much.